Please stand and hear our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Let us go to him in prayer. Our great God, we do come again this evening to continue to worship you, to continue to make known your deeds among the people, to sing your praises, to let it be known, beginning here and unto the ends of the earth, your majestic and glorious name. We praise you for creation and redemption. We praise you for what you have done in the lives of the individuals here. We pray it would continue that you would continue to save and sanctify your people. Help us this evening to continue that in spirit and truth. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take your Psalter, turn to Psalm 106a. We will sing, O praise the Lord, O thank the Lord, 106a. turn to the reading of God's word beginning in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 20. I did not notice when I was going through the schedule that we had, we were using Exodus 20 for our confession this morning, our reading of the law. So you get twice the reminder this, this Lord's day. Exodus 20. Let us pay heed to this inerrant, infallible word of our God given to us for our instruction. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. 
Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourself yourselves gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Thus for the reading of Exodus, turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. which will be our second reading for this evening, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Again, let us pay careful attention to this word of the Lord. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart to how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? 
For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and the striving after wind. Thus for the reading of the word of God. We've heard his word. Let us turn to Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day number one. It is in your bulletin. It is also on page four in the booklet that is in the pew. They should have the same words. Christian, what is thy only comfort in life and death? Answer, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Question two, how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou enjoying this comfort mayest live and die happily? Answer, three, the first, how great my sins and miseries are. The second, how I may be delivered from all my sins and miseries. The third, how I shall express my gratitude to God for such deliverance. Thus for the reading from the confession, please be seated. Just finding where I'm at. Let us pray. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring the punishment for the father's sins into the laps of their children after them. O great and powerful God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to all the ways of men. You reward everyone according to his conduct and as his deeds deserve. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all you've done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the wonder of life and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for our successes which satisfy and delight us, but also for disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ for the truth of his word and the example of his life. We thank you for his dying through which he overcame death and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know him and make him known and through him at all times and in all places that we would give thanks to you in all things. Father, we lift up this time that we can spend with you, that your word would go out. We thank you for it, that it's living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. May your word enter our hearts and our minds and our souls. Lord, as seed in a fertile ground, that it would grow, and then that it would bear fruit, and that fruit would be fruit that would glorify you. Lord, help us, whether we're children or adults or elderly adults that we would seek to have a fertile field for that seed, that you would bear fruit in us and that we would understand and glorify you as your servants. Father, thank you for today. We thank you for the morning service that we could worship you. We thank you that this is a day that you have set aside for us to worship you. We thank you for this church, which is your people. We ask that you would make us faithful, that you would give us unity and perseverance, joy and protection, 
and sanctification and be a faithful witness before you. Lord, we pray for your church worldwide, which is your bride, that you would cause it to grow, that you would tend to it, Lord, as only you can. Lord, we pray for the ministries around the world in other countries and in America that, Lord, you raise up righteous and godly men to be preachers, faithful preachers of your word, that your word would go out and accomplish your will. We pray for this church, pray for Pastor Todd, for Marlena and the girls, their family, that you would set a hedge of protection around about them, protect them from harm, from the evil one, from willful sin, that you give them wisdom, guidance, and grace every day. Father, that you would work in the leadership of this church, that we'd be faithful to you. Father, we ask for each person and each family that's here tonight that you would encourage us for those of this congregation that by sickness or other infirmity, they cannot be here, that you would be with them. Lord, help them to spend time in your word. We ask that you'd give wisdom to the leaders, that you'd bring faithfulness to the followers, and that, Father, you would cause this congregation to grow as only you can. And we ask that by faith and with focus on your word that we would do so. Lord, we pray for the parents that are here, that you would give them wisdom, guidance, and grace, that you would raise godly kids under them, that the children would walk with you and by you. Give parents the power and unction of the Holy Spirit to teach and to preach and to live by example your love in your life. Father, we ask that you would be with the pastor as he brings his message, that it would come forth and that we would understand, stay focused, and Father, that we would love you totally. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Remain seated, take your Trinity hymnal, turn to 508, and we will sing as we prepare Jesus, lover of my soul, 508. Take a breath. 
Amen. Please turn with me to the longest chapter in the Bible. Don't shame yourself. Psalm 119. Is that right, Tom? Psalm 119 is the longest one. I think Kay was looking at me funny because he's thinking I'm going to read it. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I want to read two passages, short passages. I think it's a total of about five verses, maybe more. Psalm 119, verses 49 through 52, and then we will turn over to Romans 14, which is in your bulletin. First, let us read Psalm 119, beginning in verse 49. Let us pay heed again to this word of God given to us for our instruction, and I will say this evening for our comfort and salvation and righteousness. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 14. And I will simply read verses 7 and 8. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Thus, for the reading of God's word, let us pray. Father, we do come to you this evening for comfort. We come to you for consolation from your word by your spirit. And we pray that you would work in us to know more, something more of the comfort that we do have and we should take hold of in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the work that he has done and in his word that has been given to us. Help us this uh, help us in this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come this evening to begin our walk really through the doctrines of the church. We want to study God's word in this, but we are going to be using this year the Heidelberg Catechism to guide us through our systematic study of the teaching of God's word. And so as we have read the Heidelberg Catechism for this Lord's Day, let us consider this idea of comfort that is laid out for us in those first two questions. We have read the words of the psalmist and the fact that he finds comfort in the word of God to his servant, how this is his comfort in affliction, how this is his comfort when the world or possibly even other believers deride him. His comfort is in God's word, God's law, God's promise that is contained in this word. And then we read, as Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans in this situation where there is some controversy that we will not go into, but Paul writes that unity in this situation was more important than the particular dispute and that in what may be considered minor disputes, as Paul would probably characterize this here, we all must do what we think honors the Lord, because in the end, whether we live or whether we die, if we are God's, then we are his, we are the Lord's. And so the question then before us, before you, as you have read those questions and answers, some of you twice today, Where do you find your comfort in this life? The answer is probably not what it ought to be for most of us, if we are honest. You have the advantage. So in your mind, you are probably answering properly from Heidelberg Catechism question and answer number one. But where does your comfort truly lie when you are in 
troubles or afflictions, where do you find your comfort? Most of us will find comfort or try to find comfort in our friends, our spouse, our children, a warm home on a cold night or day. When we think of comfort, we think of those things, but ultimately all those things will fail us. All those things are passing away. Instead of thinking of comfort, when we ought to be thinking of comfort, sometimes what we are really thinking of is of being comfortable. And those are two different things. That's not the question or the idea that's being asked in the catechism. Being comfortable is not the issue. If we think it is, we simply need to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who we should not think of, of as having lived a comfortable life. Jesus told us himself that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And for us, the disciple is no better or greater than his master or his teacher, so we should not expect to find it any better for ourselves in this life. If God has worked the washing of regeneration in you, if you have been saved, then there should be some discomfort in your life, for he is your master and you are no better than he. And that's really the first thing we ought to see as we think about comfort and our comfort in this life and where it comes from. How can we in this world ever find comfort in a place where the battle is raging against our very existence. We live in a world that we are not to be a part of. We live in a world that is in rebellion against our Lord and Savior. As Christians, we live in exile in this age without a nation of our own. Christ is king. He sits on his throne, but he is allowing the world to play itself out, if I can say it that way, as he uses all these vessels of dishonor as vessels to help bring sanctification to his vessels of honor. Again, how can we ever find comfort in this world, in this life? The answer is that we recognize that we do not simply belong to ourselves or find comfort in ourselves, or really ultimately in each other? The answer is that we have to remember that we are not a people that are disconnected from God. God is not out there somewhere, and we are over here on this planet, on the other end of the universe from him. And again, God is just letting things play themselves out for us. And when this life is over, he'll take us as his own and then everything will be all right. And it feels like sometimes, that's called deism, is the way that many people approach God and where he is and where we are. If you are regenerate, if you were chosen before the foundation of the world as one of God's children, then in time and space, God has saved you by applying the work of Christ to you by the Holy Spirit You are given a new heart, you are a new creation, and God himself comes to dwell within you and you live out your new life in union with Christ. Not at just some distant point in the future, but now. He is dwelling within you now. He is not at the other end of the universe. Do we live, do you live with this understanding? This is the beginning of our comfort. In him, Christ, we are told, we live and move and have our being. This is our comfort. God is with us. Jesus is our Emmanuel if we are in union with him. And my comfort is that I know by grace from God's word and spirit that in life and in death, I am his. No man can pluck me from his hand. How does this work? Similar to this morning, but possibly a little more detailed. The blood of Christ was and is the once for all sacrifice that was necessary to satisfy the wrath of God against all sins. 
This redeems us from the power of the devil. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8 says, Once you were darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Ephesians 2, you were once dead in trespasses and sins, and you walked in them, followed the course of this world, followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, but Christ came to destroy those works of darkness by his shed blood. Being redeemed from darkness, God preserves his people, meaning me, hopefully meaning you. Jesus says that all that the Father gives him, he will not lose. John chapter six, the will of the Father cannot be thwarted. And we know, and most of us are familiar with Romans eight twenty eight that all things must work together for my salvation. As the catechism says, they are subservient. All things are subservient to my salvation if I am his. Again, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And thus begins this process in us to conform us to the image of our Lord. And by the Holy Spirit, and if you aren't noticing, I'm kind of just running down through that answer. By the Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life. Romans 8, verse 16, the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, we are then what? Titus chapter three, we are heirs. Romans 8, 17 says, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Ephesians 1, 13, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit. Again, Titus 3 from this morning. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? This isn't a question. This is a statement. The Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? Do we see the connections? How about 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21? It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who also has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And that spirit, back to Romans chapter 8, is bearing witness with our spirit, 817, provided, and here's the rub, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Which is why we have this last phrase in the answer to question number one that the Holy Spirit makes me sincerely willing and ready to live unto him. Again, the Holy Spirit makes me sincerely willing and ready to live unto him. I'm not sure that I want to suffer, but he makes me willing and ready. Yet it's not I, but Christ. The secret is not something in me. The secret is not something that really changes in me, but it's someone that is in me. Colossians chapter one, verse 27. If God has chosen to make known the riches of glory to you, that mystery is Christ in you, formed in you, Christ formed in you, which is the hope of glory. Conformed to Christ, we are made willing and ready to live unto him. This is a glorious truth. To know that if we live, We live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. And then going a verse further in Romans chapter 14, back to where we somewhat began, verse 9, Paul writes, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. This all sounds great. Right? I want to be comforted in this life. I want to know that I have this comfort. Well, for this to be achieved, the catechism draws three things from Scripture that are necessary for me to have this comfort. Three things that you must know if you are to have confidence that you can live happily in this life and die happily in the Lord. And let me reemphasize that this is not so that you can be... um, happily comfortable in this life. It is so that no matter 
how comfortable you are in this life, no matter what your circumstances are in this life, you will receive a greater comfort from God himself, no matter how comfortable you are. First, you have to know, you have to know the greatness of your sin and misery. Secondly, how you are redeemed from your sin and misery. And third, how you are to be thankful to God for such redemption. Now, first, let me say that this is what the rest of the catechism covers. So we're going to be talking about this for 51 more weeks. <clears throat> the catechism is often divided into three parts after this introduction, uh, listed in various ways, but the easiest way is guilt, grace, and gratitude. Guilt, grace, and and gratitude, and it kind of goes along with these questions. So to summarize this portion uh, of the catechism, or is to summarize the entirety of the catechism. So let's just find some general instructions uh, that we get from these three answers to the second question. First, if you don't know that you are a sinner, then you don't need a savior. If you do not understand that you are lost, you will have no need to be found. What is interesting in talking with unbelievers is that it truly is useless to talk to them about the things of the Lord if they do not understand that they are a sinner. It is why Jesus said that he came for sinners, meaning he came for those that understood they are sinners, because other than that, there's not much profit, profit in talking to someone. For those that do not think they are sinners at all, the gospel is simply casting pearls before swine. But then there are those that might admit that they are sinners, although I think by sin, they often mean that they make mistakes from time to time. They do some minor infractions that people might not be so happy about, about which means that they are failing in what the catechism says is in understanding the greatness of, of their sin and misery. They might say they sin, but they, have, they don't understand the greatness of that sin. What does that mean? Well, we understand, Lord willing, as Christians, that our sin is great, not because my infraction is greater than someone else's infraction, uh, that my sin is greater than some other's sin because my stealing is greater than someone else's little white lie, my sin is great. My sin is greater because I understand that it is not just against another person. My sin is against a holy and righteous and eternal God, first and foremost. And as a Christian, now think about this. As a Christian, my sin, your sin, is even greater than when you were not a Christian. Why? Because now you know. Now you know. Now again, in the big picture, all sin is sin. But when you weren't a Christian and you were unaware of your sin, how great a sin could that be? But now you know better. Now you know God, and yet you still sin. That's how great your sin is. That is the greatness of your sin. You even know, I even know, and we still sin. What is necessary for me to be comforted in this life and in death? Believe it or not, it is to know the greatness of my sin and how it is even greater than that of an unbeliever because they can barely know better, but I do. How am I comforted in this? Back to the answer to question number one. I am comforted because I belong to God. And by his blood, by his precious blood, he is fully satisfied for all my sins. As an unbeliever, I don't have that comfort. Only in Christ can I find comfort that knowing my sins, past, present, and future, Christ came to shed his blood for those exact particular sins. 
That is my comfort, as ironic as it might sound. In addition to knowing the greatness of my sin and misery, to be comforted, I must know how, how I am then delivered from all my sins and miseries. The short answer is that I am delivered by the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is how I am delivered from my sin and misery. By repentance and belief in the person and work of Jesus as presented in his word, I find salvation in Christ with the application by the Holy Spirit. And so I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will ultimately be saved on judgment day. In other words, we really have to be about the business of understanding the whole counsel of God and how that applies to my sin and misery. As we discussed in some measure this morning, I need to know that God in eternity past in the counsel of his own will determined to save a people unto himself. He purposed to this himself. It is not of our works uh, that we have survived but by God's decree. And so God in his goodness and loving kindness appeared in the person of the God man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to be that sacrifice, to serve as the mediator of the covenant for his people. That in accomplishing this work, the triune God then sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, and by grace through faith in Christ alone, you have been saved. And by continuing in that grace, which is a continuance of God and not of yourself. You are being saved. And by that grace on the last day, you will stand before God in Christ and will ultimately and finally be redeemed all because of what God has done, not because of anything you have done. That's my comfort. And that was a long, somewhat of a long answer. But I said all of that to counter this. If the answer to how I am delivered from my sins, all my sins and miseries, is dependent upon anything in me, I remain in misery. I remain in sin. I cannot escape my sin. I am a fallen creature. There is none righteous. No, not one. I do not know. I do not know what it is like for nominal Christians who are trying to save themselves Or be good enough to be saved. Because I'm not and I'll never be good enough myself. But I think I would be in great despair if I believed I had anything to do with my salvation. All my joy, all my hope, all my comfort comes from the fact that God has saved me and continues to save me and will save me. The doctrines of grace the right teaching of Scripture in regard to the state of man and the sovereign redemption by Jesus Christ of his people is the only comfort, is the only gospel, the only true good news that can give comfort that he saves me all in all and that nothing is dependent upon me. There is no comfort. There is no good news. If I have to save myself, I'm doomed. Or if in my own strength I have to maintain my salvation, I'm doomed. Which leads to the third teaching of Scripture that we must know to have comfort in this life and death. We must then know how to express the gratitude to God for such deliverance. And this is where we find out what our, what our duties are before God. The catechism calls our Uh, our obligations or our duties, they're actually called our gratitude. And I think it would be good if we all reminded ourselves, reminded each other, instead of thinking of these things as obligations, think of them as our gratitude, our thanksgiving. If we love the Lord, the things we do in response to this great salvation is not an obligation. It is an act of thanksgiving and of gratitude in response again to our God's great salvation. And gratitude comforts us because it is our act of thanksgiving. Think of it this way. As soon as we start doing something to achieve a greater end, 
i.e., in this case, if we are showing gratitude or trying to show thanksgiving so that we might achieve salvation, we immediately lose any comfort in that action. When we are simply trying to please God to get something out of him, then we immediately question if I've done enough. And there is no comfort in that. When we are pleasing God simply because we love him, because of what he has done, and we know that he is pleased, as he has told us, even in our frail, stumbling attempts, we receive the comfort of a loving father for his child who knows the limits and the capabilities of his children. And further we are comforted because we know that this is the way of Christ. Our Lord lived a life that was pleasing to God, that was one of obligation, but one of thanksgiving, that was one of suffering, but was one of comfort. In contradiction to to his life, our life, for us, this life is a life of sanctification. He was perfect and we are not. And so for us, it is a life of being conformed to the image of our Savior. And if we are united to Christ in salvation, we will be comforted as our Lord was comforted when he walked the earth. And we will be comforted by the Holy Spirit with the truth that in this sanctifying work, we are being conformed to the image of our Lord. And so quickly, let me just say as an outline for the remainder of this catechism, for your benefit, if you're making notes, we are going to quickly see our guilt in the second through the fourth Lord's days. We are going to see the grace of God then in the fifth to the 32nd Lord's Days. For those that were here this morning, you might find it interesting and another support for the means of grace that word and sacrament are found in the section under grace of what God does, not what we do. And then again, the third section that we will cover, gratitude, which contains our good works, is found from the 32nd Lord's Day to the end. But again, in each of these sections, guilt, grace, and gratitude, we find comfort as those united to Christ. When you are talking to other Christians, especially uh, if they are having spiritual issues, I would suggest that it is normally because they have a misunderstanding of one of these three areas. If you are not feeling comforted in this life, you are having a misunderstanding in one of these three areas. You either do not understand the greatness of your sin, you do not understand the grace of God and your salvation, or you have begun to think that you are living up to some sort of standard yourself and you lack the gratitude of one who has been given by grace such a great salvation. Our comfort And this fallen world comes from the person and work of Christ. And he has provided the means for you to have a high degree of comfort in this life, regardless of your personal circumstances, when you trust in him for your salvation and what he continues to do to persevere that salvation by the work of the Holy Spirit. The comfort in our affliction, Psalm 119, is not in us, is not in our friends, is not even in our spouses or our parents. Our comfort is that God remembers. God remembers his promises. God remembers his word to his servants. And whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. By God's grace, we will see these truths more fully as we work through the great doctrines of scripture together this year. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have given us a book, your word, the Bible, that provides us with vast amounts of comfort in your law, in your promise, in all of its words, in narrative, in declarative, in history. 
and psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, in the sin where we find ourselves born into this world, but then the grace that you bring and the gratitude that we can have. Help us, Lord, be comforted by your word, be comforted by your spirit as we come to more fully understand how this works. We pray it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Stand with me if you are able. Take your hymnal, turn to 197, and we will sing, Comfort, Comfort, Ye My People. of our God and after you have suffered a little while the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore confirm strengthen and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever amen